Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Rachel Adams from the Department of English and the Program in American Studies. And I need to recognize the many people, programs, and departments that helped to make tonight's event possible before I introduce our speaker. So thank you to the wait. Thank you to the Hyman Center for the Humanities for sponsoring this talk as part of its discipline series, Evaluation, Value, and Evidence. Thanks also to our co-sponsors, the School of Journalism, the English Department, the Center for the Study of Social Difference, and the Future of Disability Studies Projects. I also want to offer a personal thanks to Sarah Monks and Nick Oburn for their tremendous efforts to organize and promote this event and also to my students for giving me opportunities to read and discuss Life Animated and for being part of our audience tonight. I am just delighted to introduce Ron Suskind, who I believe needs very little introduction for many people in the room. He's currently the senior fellow at Harvard's Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics. His first book, A Hope in the Unseen, an American Odyssey from the Inner City to the Ivy League, based on Pulitzer Prize-winning journalism, tells the story of Cedric Jennings as he journeys from a failing public high school in Washington, D.C. to his first year at Brown University. Suskind is also the author of many best-selling works about politics, the workings of national government, and challenges to our democratic system including Confidence Men, The Way of the World, The One Percent Doctrine, and The Price of Loyalty, George W. Bush, The White House, and The Education of Paul O'Neill. He's also written for The New York Times Magazine, Esquire, and The Wall Street Journal. Ron Suskind's most recent book, Life Animated, A Story of Sidekicks, Heroes, and Autism, is the reason he's here with us tonight. And I want to just take a minute to tell you what I appreciate about this book, which I've had the pleasure of sharing with my students this week. There are many, many memoirs by parents of children with disabilities out there in the world. The numbers growing every day. Rarely do they get the kind of attention Life Animated has received. Thanks to Suskind's acclaim as a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and a best selling author. With that attention, this book is an important and very public reminder that disability can happen to any family at any time. It recounts the financial and emotional strains that disability places on families in a society that provides too few resources and support, the vast, often acknowledged and undercompensated labor done by mothers who still do the lion's share of caregiving whether or not they work outside the home, and especially when their children are disabled. And through the example of Walt Suskind, the invaluable and also often unrecognized contribution of brothers and sisters who did not choose to have disabled siblings and yet on a daily basis provide us the most natural and perfect models of inclusion. In my rereading of the book this week, I decided Walt, there are many heroes in the book, but is one of the real heroes, and I hope that I have a chance to meet him one day. Life Animated is a story about the ways our schools fail and succeed in educating students with disabilities, about the resilience of families, and the capacities and potential that can be unleashed by following the affinities of people with disabilities, rather than trying to force them into molds created for their typical peers. Owen Suskind posed a difficult task for any writer when he chose Disney, seemingly the most commercial and sanitized of cultural outlets, as the intense nexus of his inner life. Yet his father, the storyteller, rises to the occasion in managing to write about Owen's passions with humor and honesty, but without lapsing into sentimentality or platitude. He celebrates Owen's triumphs while also writing frankly of his setbacks and the ongoing challenges he'll face in a culture that tends to turn its back on people with autism once they reach adulthood. We're fortunate to have Ron Suskind not only to speak on their behalf, but to enable Owen to speak for himself and in his own way. 
please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Rachel. Rachel, of course, wrote a terrific book called Raising Henry that is a cousin of Life Animated. Um, it's, a, it's an honor to be introduced by you. Thank you. Um, it's nice to be back here at Columbia. I spent some years here uh, in, well, one year here, actually 10 months, uh, getting my master's in journalism in 1983. And, um, and I'm going to do a bit of a long uh, full circle journey for you tonight. I'm going to talk about uh, what I've learned more or less since then and get into the issues of narrative, of what I've learned often the hard way, often against my will, about narrative and how it works and how it can work better, uh, especially as the times change. I mean, the fact is, is that we all know the power of story. That's nothing new. But of course, these days, it's kind of Storyville all over America between moth and and all the things we're hearing. I mean, every TED Talk basically is a story. People are just bursting with stories, and we're finding a nice marketplace for it. People are listening, and I kind of like that. You know, I've been telling stories since I'm this big, and it's nice to have company. Um, but I'll say that the struggle of how to do what I was naturally suited to do, and which I think most of us are naturally suited to do, in my professional life, was something that I felt from the very beginning. Because I'm trained as a journalist, and I came up the traditional way. I went out of Columbia here, and I went to the New York Times, uh, which, uh, um, where I was a copy boy. Uh, my mother was living in Boca Raton at that point at something called the Polo Club, <laughs> named after the great long line of great Jewish polo stars. And, um, and of course, I was the editor of the New York Times at the Polo Club, but I was really getting coffee for people. And... And I got to write for the paper, and I was trained. Then I went to the St. Pete Times. Then I went up to a magazine in Boston called Boston Business Magazine, which was kind of a Manhattan Inc. of that era. And then I went to the Wall Street Journal, all of which was training in the rigors of journalism. You know, block and tackle. Get it right. Offer complexity. Embrace it. Make it discernible. But I think I was feeling penned in. Because I, I wasn't quite sensing that I was expressing a deeper core of who I was in what I was doing, and I wanted that. So let's jump ahead to the Wall Street Journal and a key moment of frisian. Uh, and the moment is that uh, when you write a front page story in the Wall Street Journal, it's kind of a big deal. In those days, certainly, there was just the, you know, the front page is three stories. This is prehistoric times. This is 1992, give or take. And, uh, and so you had you know, the two leaders on one side, which are the big important stories, and the journal was making a decision. You ought to read these stories today. These are our big three, and then uh, a head in the middle. And periodically, I would have an opportunity uh, to, well, I was, I was on the, the uh, 722 train out of Fairfield, Connecticut, on one day when one of my front page stories was running in the, in the Wall Street Journal. And it was a story I believed a lot in. And I was sitting there, and people, of course, on the 722 out of Fairfield, they're all reading the journal, a lot of them, a lot of Wall Street types on the earlier trains. And I'm watching a guy read the paper, and, and about three graphs down on my beloved front page story, he jumps to money investing. I'm like, what the hell is he doing? So I, he's just right across, like where this guy's sitting. And so I basically, I get up and I go, uh, ex excuse me. And he goes, oh, what? what? I said, what, what happened there? What happened? What do you mean? Well, you just jumped. You didn't read anymore. What? I, the best part is later. <laughs> I mean, I thought he was going to call it security, Metro North security. But, <laughs> but instead, after a minute, he kind of calmed down. You know, I don't know what he thought. I was a short Jewish mugger on the plunge in the train. And uh, I'm like, you know, help me. He's like, well, I kind of already know about this. I got to the graph. That's the nut graph, right? The cosmic graph. 
for those who are non-journalists, the graph that tells you why you ought to read this story, why it's important, why it fits together, big ideas. Sit down. Here's what I'm going to prove. He's like, I kind of know everything I need to know about that. So I jumped. I'm like, ah, uh -huh. really? Okay. I did this experiment at least eight more times on that train over the next year. Then I moved to Washington, D.C. for a job where I was the senior national affairs writer for the Wall Street Journal. And that's a job you've got to kill people to get. And I killed 10 people to get the job. Family, nice guys, family men. So, but something was happening. So we're going to weave a couple stories together to show how I inadvertently, and again, often against my will, and against what I'm taught with my graduate degrees, against what I thought would be right. So now, let's do subtext, because we're going to talk about my book, Life Animated, and now everyone knows everything. I've lived a very public life for the last 30 years, but it was a public crafted existence. And with this book, Life Animated, we made a decision, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, where we said we should let people know what was really going on in our life. And what was really going on. Because the two things fit together. What's really going on is we moved down from Boston, the Boston Bureau of the Wall Street Journal, to Washington, D.C. for this new job in the Washington Bureau. And we leave, we leave with the, the standard garden variety of bullions. Young family, my wife and I, Cornelia, also a writer, two seemingly wonderful and perfect children, uh, Walter, who then was five, and Owen, who was two and a half. And, um, you know, I don't know. We were reaching for all the things we were taught to want, I suppose. Um, you know, the brief digression is that we're all products of a sun and a moon, a mother and a father. You should know who they are so you'll know who the hell I am. Uh, uh, my uh, father um, uh, was a guy who was frustrated, maybe wanted to do other things in his life, uh, was an insurance man, and he writes a letter to me and my brother, uh, when he's 46, saying, I hope you boys never read this letter, but I can't ignore what the doctors have said. It's one of those letters written from a hospital bed. Um, he says all of the things that we often don't say to our children. Uh, I am unspeakably proud when I gaze upon you boys, that you're my children, almost with disbelief that you could be my sons. I am crushed that I will never see you grow to be men. But I will tell you this. If you carry with you the values of our home, just as I carry the values of the home I grew up in, I think you'll have just about everything you need. But then he says something interesting. He challenges us toward the end of the letter. He says, but one thing I'll ask of you, life is precious time, so precious. Do something worthwhile with your lives. Don't compromise there. Trust me, everything else will work out. He says something right before that. He says, and, and just remember, you two boys don't owe me and your mother anything. You have given us more by being our children, by being a presence in our life than we ever possibly could give to you. My mother disagrees with that almost on every <laughs> level, really. I work my fingers to the bone. Both of you, you owe me big, everything. They're both right. And so I was trying to please them both, which is why at the behest of my wife, the brilliant Cornelia, I became a journalist. My mother early on made it pretty clear to me, not in so many words, but more or less, and it's something I think will be common to some people in this room. She says, I won't love you any less if you're not a success. She's from Brooklyn. She's about this tall. I just won't mention your name to other people, just you know. <laughs> Which is very common. Later as a reporter, I would sit and talk to women, men too, but more often women of a certain age, about their families. And after half an hour, I'd say, there's a child other than the doctor. Is this true? Or can I hear about him? Oh, right. So I was pleasing them both, reaching for the worthwhile life and going to Washington to write 
national affairs stories for the biggest newspaper in the United States, and everything was fabulous, and then disastrously, it was not. And every day I come home from work, and Cornelia has another story to tell. There's something wrong with Owen. I said, what do you mean? Maybe it's, it's just change. No, no, it's not just change. It's not trans transition. He can't look at me. He's not looking at me. He's walking around like a person with their eyes shut. And after a month and then another month, the 250 word or so, three-year-old vocabulary, two and a half years old, is down to one word, juice, a single word. At which point we start to see doctors. And then soon enough we see a specialist. And we sit in this waiting room. And then we walk into her office. She, she wants Owen to walk between where we are and her in her office. And I bend down and I say, buddy, just walk like you used to walk just this one time. Of course he does. He weaves down the hall. Lost. We sit in the office a minute later. She starts to talk about developmental issues, and then after about 10 minutes, she uses the word autism. Um, I don't remember much after that, actually, in the, in the meeting. You know, Cornelia and I remember this day like it was Tuesday. You know, both of us almost seemed to lift out of our bodies at that point. We were floating up near the drop ceiling looking down on these parents, these two people, and, and our son off in the corner, looking at his hands. We left those people in the office. We, they are gone. I used to miss them, but I don't anymore. After we left, something was very different. It's interesting, part of what you do as a journalist is is a rule that I eventually craft. Um, and I craft it largely through getting whacked about understanding why we feel the way we feel and why we do what we do. You know, when I left the Boston Bureau of the Wall Street Journal, I was different. And do you think it's demonstrably different in what I did? Now, I wrote well. I felt I wrote well. I could tell a story. But I also had a zest for, you know, a kind of a, a, a kind of a bruising quality of purpose, if you will. I was doing what a lot of journalists do, which is lining up cardboard cutouts of conflict. Greedy CEO, line worker about to lose their job. Government bureaucrat is beleaguered and welfare mom conflict. What we do as journalists, you set up cardboard cutouts that are stereotypes. You set them up against each other. You get the conflict. How many editors will say, where's the conflict here? You get to cover a lot of ground quickly. And you got to get home because you got to have dinner that night. You got a story to file. That's mostly what I did. And when I left the Boston Bureau, my going away party, they bought me a, a train, a Lionel trains, you know the trains? They bought me a Lionel train bridge, and they burned a hole in the middle of it for the Ron Suskind Burn Bridges Society on a list. But I was changing. Didn't realize it. What's happening this time? I'm a mess, first off. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Because before I look back, I was pretty smug. Pretty certain. Give me a question, I got the answer. Give me a topic, any topic, like any good journals, I will run up that learning curve in a week or a day, if that's what it takes. But I couldn't do that, not like I used to. And I basically was weaving around. What do I do? A buddy of mine named Tony Horwitz, who you may know, 
uh, writes books. Uh, was here at Columbia with me in 83, won a Pulitzer II at the Journal. Tony had just come back from Bosnia uh, and written some great stories, including one about the capacity of children to be hopeful in war zones. And, and, uh, and Tony and I were roommates here on Am Amsterdam 118th. And we're buddies, and we're com guys, we're competitive, you know. So we were both the national affairs writers for the journal at that point, and I'm like, let's see if I can better Tony here. And I decide that uh, here's a story. I'd written some stories from blighted urban terrain, and I said, you know, think about it. Um, uh, you know, learning across town in Washington, D.C. is a kind of feat. How different is it from a kid in Bosnia learning like they found a calculus book on the street of Bosnia? Sure, with bullets flying. Hell, we find a kid like that, we'd roll a red carpet from Harvard to the former Yugoslavia to get him. But here in this country, we say, oh, let me explain. There's this meritocracy. Do you have some test scores I can see? I said, what's that about? So I go to the worst high school I can find in America, which happens to be in Washington, D.C., conveniently. And I start to search for hidden lights, lights hidden in this off and over the cliff population at this blighted school, almost all African American. 400 kids a day are absent out of 1,400 at this school. Guns galore, metal detectors. 10 kids a year are killed in this area, some in the school, and I'm watching them pass, looking for ways to get to them. First kid I sit with, the principal's office, he gave me a little office near his, his array of offices, a kid named Lawrence Abbott. I said, so, uh, uh, you're a good student here, right? Uh-huh. Uh, a minus, that's right, A minus. Got many friends? Nuh uh Want to go to college? Uh-huh. <laughs> this is first-rung reporting here. We do a half an hour of the monosyllables, and out he goes. I might as well be talking across a hundred-foot-wide divide. Race and class, us and them, black and white. I get up to the M's, some kid named Manning. I'm there the whole week. I told the principal, I want to talk to your best students. I think it's a feat to learn here. He's like, fine, that's a fine pitch. Right, you stay in the little conference room with the cinder block. Don't leave it. 82 kids with a B average or better out of 1,400. They have great inflation at Harvard, but not here. So I go through them one after another. So I get to the Mannings, and after a half an hour of the monosyllables, he says, what, are you here to be my savior? I said, uh, um, Jewish, we don't do saviors. And this is the only laugh I get in a week. That's how bad it's going. Then I'm leaving the principal's office, because he's like, I guess you're done now, sus guy. And I said, I guess so. I don't know. It's not working out. I could have told you it wasn't going to work out. You see, we have a term for these guys, these students. We call them undercover honor students. They won't raise their hands in class. They won't get everything right. They don't want the paper stuck up there. They won't be conspicuous here. To be conspicuous here is dangerous, especially for academics. Kids walking around here can't imagine what the future's like. 16-year-old boy, 17. You don't want to be conspicuous in this building. And you're here, undercover auditions, to uncover them. I said, okay, got it. I'm walking out. Who's walking in? A kid bumps me, points at the principal, says, my computer science teacher is a problem with me as a person, not my work. I deserve an A-plus in the class to give me an A-minus. I'm fighting it. I'll be back. How he goes? I'm like, who's that? That's Cedric Jennings. Stay away from him. He's nothing but trouble. I said, who is he? Well, he's probably our valedictorian. He's a junior. Uh, you know. I said, he wasn't on my list. Well, I, I took him off. Really? Could you explain that to me as my parting door prize? Sure. Sure. Well, he's got a quick tongue, and uh, he wears those A's like a shining breastplate. Shove it in kids' faces. There are fights in the hall. It's a mess. It's not just he's got a quick tongue. He's too damn proud is his problem. 
I said, proud. <clears throat> like pride goeth before the fall. Kind of. Yeah, that's right. Where's he now? Well, he's up in chemistry. So I asked for a hall pass to go to the boys' room. Uh, before I drive to my side of town. Okay, he scribbles it. Principal rude the day. For many years, he gave me that hall pass. So, of course, I went up to find Cedric. And that's where we form a union. When I first see him, he is... He's having an argument with another student who's copying his homework. We end up in the little lab area. I said, look, let me explain this to you. I'm kind of a mess. I've been here for a week and a half. I got nothing. I, I just, I don't know anything, okay? I thought I knew things. I don't know things. I'm giving up my knowingness here, my omniscience. I didn't realize that Owen had surgically removed it from me. I thought I knew everything. I thought everything was working. Sure, all part of a plan. Now what? Cedric doesn't know any of this. I don't even recognize it. That's what's happening. I'm like, look, look, I am not who I seem. You just have to help me. Okay, just let me see what you see just for one day, hell, one hour, and I will have learned something. I'll have something to say. He sits there for a minute, doesn't say anything. He goes, all right, all right, all right. I, I, I'm going to teach you. I got some questions for you. I said, okay. Where'd you go to college? I said, me? Yeah, you. Uh, University of Virginia. Oh, that's a good one. He's got the Barron's books at this point. You go to graduate school? Yeah, Columbia. Columbia. Oh, nice. You do any teaching or anything like that? Some of you guys teach, right? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did a little one up in yeah, Cambridge. Harvard? You taught at Harvard and I'm teaching you what? This is a scam. I'm not buying it. He gets up, he walks out. I chase him down the hall. I'm a desperate man. I'm like, no, no, no. You... What do I want to tell him? I want to tell him all those gleaming credentials, those shining brass plaques are not all you think they are. I'm learning that. I thought they meant everything. Now I'm looking at a child in my home who doesn't even register. He is in the discard pile. You know, it's amazing. It's amazing what you walk around with, loaded into your chest about the things your children will become. I don't realize it until Owen's in the class, the first class. He's there with another autistic spectrum kid and one Downs kid, Down syndrome kid. And Cornelia and I are sitting on, on the mats observing first day. Three kids in the class, four teachers. School for special needs kids. I see the kid with Down syndrome. I don't know anything at this point. I just know uninformed stereotypes. I know nothing about Down's kids and their emotional acuities, their compensatory strengths, zero. What I know is I knew a Down syndrome kid when I was a kid, and I wasn't very nice to him, and I had nothing to offer. You know, I was only this big. I was good for the circus, not much else. But I wasn't nice to this kid. None of us were. And that's where Owen ends up, in his class. And I'm feeling bad for myself. And I started to think about the traditional load you carry. You know, I had two sons, so I figured two Nobel Prize winners after both served as president. And then Olympic medals, possibly. Or something even better. How big is that load? Well, I had to pull them out that day, sitting on the mat one at a time and smash them in the corner. The pile is quite high. And while I'm doing that, I look up and the Down syndrome kid is right here looking at me. No, I'm sitting, he's standing, he's only this tall. 
It was in Maine. It was at Cornelia. And it was back in May. And then uh, he hugs me. He sees there are two miserable people sitting here. <laughs> and he hugs us both. I think he hugged Cornelia. I'm not sure I was upside down at that point. And so when Cedric says, get lost, there's nothing you're going to see in here. I'm chasing them. I'm like, no, no. I'm sure, I'm sure if you let me in, it'll work. Just let me in. And that's where that all starts. I wouldn't have admitted that years ago. I felt like as a journalist, I needed to be titanium hard. No one needs to know anything about me. I ask the questions. You answer them. And all of a sudden, that was over. So that's where the journey starts. And in some ways, it's well along, but not any different now. What was happening is that the silent child, silent for years, was teaching us, changing us. Jump ahead. We start writing things at the Wall Street Journal at this point, including the series about Cedric Jennings and the other kids of Blue High School, which wins the Pulitzer Prize. Now, you have here in the room my partner in that, Guy sitting over there, John Brecher, was the page one editor of the Wall Street Journal for many years, the greatest I think we have had in that role, Jim Stewart notwithstanding, another buddy. Both of them were great. John was more me. And we started to talk in this period, in the mid-90s, when all this is happening, about the idea of a nut graphless front page story. A big giant story, no nut graph. Started from what happened on the trains, John's insights already. What was happening broadly in terms of narrative? We were cresting 80s into 90s into what are an earlier version of the divided and tendentious period we're well along into now. Kill or be killed. What was happening? Around the, the wide array of Vox Populi, people were ingesting more and more through the 90s and into the aughts sort of crafted offerings from the world of journalism. The great wide middle was getting disintermediated. Was that the term? By we get the time we get to the aughts, it's well along. People were saying, I already decided about that. I'm good. Not reading it. So we start dri driving forward writing nut graphless front page stories. Just get in the shoes of the actor. You know what? Inner city African American, everyone has a PhD on that. Beleaguered teacher, yeah, people can do their own riff on that. Just get in their shoes, start to walk. Where are they going? Well, there's a little twist here. Ooh, I thought it should go the other way. No, go this way. Oh, yeah, this, I thought it was, it's left, it's right. Just like life. So what I start to think as I'm writing those front page stories as the starting point of a book of hope in the unseen in the 95 to 98 is that we could go deeper, wider, to write a slightly different version of nonfiction narrative where we really are living in the skin of our characters. Okay, quick jump. I'm giving credit to all the people who are part of this. Not just John, who was my beloved and editor, but there's another editor who jumped into the fray, a guy named John Sterling, who at those, in those days was the editor of something called Broadway Books, which was a big random house division. When I'm writing A Hope in the Unseen, I write up a part of it that happened um, sort of right after I start the book, when Cedric, the character, graduates from high school. The scene is so moving to me that as I write it, I kind of come a little unglued. And I write it 
like I'm seeing and feeling what the characters are seeing and feeling. Now, I've spent so much time with them at this point. We're already going into years. I'm pretty good on what they're feeling and seeing and, and their sensations. Of course, I ask them later, right, boom. Now, I write about 100 pages, mostly a recrafting of what was in the journal and this scene of Cedric graduating, and John Sterling calls me up to New York. This is the first chunk of the book. Now, I've never written a book before. You know, I'm, I'm feeling wildly insecure. Sterling sits me down with one of his editors, and I said, so what do you think? He's like, we really liked it. I'm like, okay, like. Uh, yeah, liked it. I said, no love anywhere? He said, you know, maybe it's an issue with me. Maybe I wasn't breastfed or something. I need love here. He's like, well, one part we loved. This graduation scene. I said, really? Yeah, yeah. You're like in their heads. It's like, well, it's what we expect of our fiction writers. We don't expect this of even high-end New Yorker writing. I mean, this is different. I said, yeah, okay. So? Could you do the whole book like that? I'm like, what? I don't, I'm not sure. I don't know how would that work. And so we start to talk <laughs> about how that would work. I said, well, most of the best stuff I have is, uh, is um, you know, people doing Casper the Ghost quotes. You know what they are. A subject talking to a reporter with their back to the camera. Quote, quote, quote. I said, I can't use any of them. No. That's all now part of what's in their noggin. So I can only write what I can see and describe. Right. And you can interview them again and again about what they're feeling as that occurs. Okay, that's about four times more reporting than I was anticipating. Fine. That's how I wrote that book. Now, when it comes out in 1998, people notice this. They call it the new, new nonfiction. What's interesting is that it goes further down the path of what John and I were talking about at the journal of how to get across the minefield of why bother already decided. Because you now have 13 characters, Cedric the main actor, and 12 supporting, and you're in the shoes of all of them. I don't put in any $22 words like affirmative action. I don't tell the reader what to think. They're going to decide. That's the way that book's written. You're going to feel what they feel, and you're going to see, here's the big concept, the good enough reasons. This is like a semi-religious notion of mine. People do what they do for good enough reasons. Good enough that intent flows to action, the thing you can see. They may be your reasons or mine, but they're good enough. Know those reasons. And you can know a person almost as, as well as you can know another. Now, it's going to take work to get in there because they often don't want to tell you that. Some of those reasons go way deep. But Hope in the Unseen comes out and people don't have me as the intermediary. The characters are talking directly to the reader. They're walking with them. They're sitting with them. They're bleeding with them. And I don't tell them what to think. I love many of the writers who do it a little differently. I love Jonathan Kozel. I love Alice Kotlowitz. They have been inspirations to me. But I started to read their books, and I started to say, especially Jonathan, I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm getting everything. It seems like I'm not getting some things that might make me feel maybe not so positive about the character's virtues, let's say, that might stand in the way of me getting to a moment of usable guilt at the end of the book. Look, I did this myself. I feel it. I want the reader to be moved. And I'm not giving the reader very much credit, actually, because, well, they're the reader. What do they know? They're busy. I need to sell it. I need to whack it. This book, I tried a new thing. Let the reader figure it out. Trust them. They're up to the complexity. They have lives just like the characters, complicated but they're up to getting it. And that's why that book is written that way and that's why it still works. 
It's not really rooted to a place in time. It still sells. It was at the center of affirmative action debates. Because folks, when it came out, ended up in an odd place. Someone for affirmative action, someone against it, someone who has strong feelings about preferential treatment of minorities, somebody who says, this is a disaster, and they're both in the tent together going, what are you doing here? You're my enemy. Well, this kid, he's kind of my guy. No, he's my guy. Which parts are yours? This, well, that's, well, that's kind of both of ours. That was the, the twist. We are down the path in terms of almost every one of these challenges. That's 1998. That's before we get into the dis dissolution of much of the intermediary community. That we go to a place like Columbia to join. Where whole countries are sitting in cul-de-sacs hearing what they're supposed to want to hear. Jump ahead. I'm sitting with Karen Hughes in the George W. Bush White House. How does this express itself? Here's how. I was doing another book, kind of a follow-up to Hope in the Unseen. But then, a few months after 9-11, four or five months, I'm talking to a friend of mine, David Granger, the editor of Esquire magazine, and he's like, Ron, something weird is happening. Journalists are being accused of being unpatriotic for simply doing their job. I said, I know. It's all over Washington. I can feel it. It's like the air is ionized. Yeah. So uh, why don't you do a piece for Esquire while you're doing your next book? You know, on the Bush White House. I said, fine. So there's a particular advisor. Now it's part of dusty history. A woman named Karen Hughes. Remember her? You had Rove and Hughes, Carl and Karen, who were kind of the left and right hand of the young, fresh and ready George W. Bush. So I go to do a profile of Karen Hughes. I figure the president's right-hand man is a woman. They're having some trouble with midterm voters with the 2002 election coming up. I make my pitch. They let me in the door. They're a little confused because they read A Hope in the Unseen and they're not sure what to think about me. So there I am. Very telling, before I ask Karen anything about George W. Bush, we start to talk about journalism in this period. It's fascinating. She's like, well, you know, it's different now. I said, really? Yeah. <laughs> now, I was armed with an interesting story. There's an interesting story here. Jerry Maserati, who was the editor of the New York Times Magazine, was in with Hughes around this time, and he was talking to her about the coverage the Times wanted to do of the new president. Okay? This is a little later, but around this time. Same conversation. And he goes back to a piece that the Times written in the mid-70s on Gerald Ford, which was a signature piece. The reporter got two weeks, was flying the wall. Certainly the reporter went back to go over what was in the story. Obviously not changing quotes, but saying, here's what we got, here's what we're going to write. Do you have a comment? The signature piece, Jerry tells Karen about Gerald Ford. Historians embrace it, the one and only. And she's like, huh, really? Okay. So she opens her drawer, and she pulls out, I think it was a Time Magazine cover, don't quote me, which George W. Bush kind of pointing. She said, this is a very positive story for us. This cost us 17 minutes. And if it wasn't so good, next time they'd get 10. Explain. Let me explain. She said the same thing to me. We kind of don't need you anymore. We have our own friendly media. They have a very wide footprint, getting wider all the time. So we kind of don't need the mainstream press. And in fact, she and others said something to me which stopped me, created a cold chill in me. We view you not as a special profession. We view you just like another lobby, you know, like healthcare, And one that's not very friendly to us. So what's happening? Brilliant innovation by tacticians of this period. They start to say, we are going to use access and view it like a commodity. When you starve it, when you, when you curtail it, you can trade more for each dollop. Without access, you're nothing. Brilliant. 
Under Clinton, not like that. You could call Clinton at 2 in the morning on the bathroom phone. Let me just say, I shouldn't be talking to you now, but I will. <laughs> Great access. And that was over. And it ain't no better with Obama. It's not about party. It's about power. When power finds a model like this that's effective, it'll be repeated until it is shown to be ineffective. Nothing personal. Divided conversations of an increasingly divided country. Some historians say we're as divided now, coastal and inland, as we were north and south before the Civil War. Each with their own media telling them exactly what they're hoping to hear. Challenge, huge challenge for narrative. I try to write other books to crack it. Four big doorstops that Rachel's mentioning in that wide middle. I'm still being driven in the same ways by the education of Owen. No different. It's getting deeper, in fact, uh, wider, more pressing. What does he end up doing? Well, the one thing he was before and after the onset of the autism, he loves the Disney animated movies. This is a tragic moment for me and my wife. Oh my God, this is all he wants to do. After he's speechless, he's watching them with peculiar intensity. 50 therapy sessions a day. We're soon bankrupt. Interesting, one of the doctors, after that tall, a severe woman said autism, she was actually a terrific doctor. We found another doctor who was brilliant, a, a Jewish guy uh, about that tall. I felt a bond with him instantly. And he became our guy, Alan Rosemont. And uh, we said, is it OK? He just he wants to watch these movies all the time. Well, is he joyful? Seems to be. Does he seem comfortable? Yeah. His motor function went to hell. Autism. He had gone from a big boy cup, which he had graduated to a year and a half before, to a sippy cup. He was knocking it over, the baby cup. Alan Rosenblatt at one point said to me, he says, uh, what is it you do, uh, by the way, for a living? I said, oh, me? Yeah, you. I'm a reporter. He's like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. I said, why? Well, you just paid me 150 bucks for this, and you know, you're going to need three of these a week. It's not covered. Ah, right, got it. Have you, are you good with numbers? I said, meds and meds. He's like, investment banking. It's a very fine profession. You might think about that. I said, this is what I do. It's all I do. It's all I can do. I'm a reporter. I do stories. Well, you better be good at it, he says. Really good. <laughs> so Owen watches the movies. First, The Little Mermaid. Anyone here have seen that movie? Oh, come on. Everyone. Especially women, men of this age. Anyone in their 20s lived on this movie. I am of this community, and my kids are in their 20s. Disney, after a couple of decades in the trough, comes roaring back in 1989 with The Little Mermaid. Basically, they get all the Hollywood people together with the Broadway people. It's a Broadway show, animated. Owen's watching it incessantly in this first year of silence. He's four years old. He's burbling a teeny bit, a few months, but eight, nine, ten months in. He's saying, juicer runs, juicer runs, juicer runs. We say, dude, some kind of noise, some sort of expression. We can't. It's baby talk. We figure he's back to infancy and he's trying to learn to talk again. I guess we're hopeful of that. Juice servos, juice servos, juice servos. Cornelia thinks he wants more juice. She gives him juice. He dips the cup, knocks it over. We're up in the bedroom, a year in to the silence. And we're doing the only thing we can do as a family, the four of us, me, Walter, Owen Cornelia, watching The Little Mermaid. It's a key part of the movie. You probably know this. Everyone knows this. It's Disney. Lingua Franca. It's when Ariel, the spoiled and selfish mermaid, you know, you know Ariel. What's, you can sing the song, right? 
Look at this stuff. Isn't it neat when you think my collection is complete? When you think I'm the girl, I'm the girl who has everything. Not enough. She works at Goldman Sachs now. She's doing fine. Partner. And, um, and she wants anything to get her man. And she trades with Ursula the Sea Witch, Pat Carroll. Well, her voice. It won't cost you much a trifle, really. Just your voice. Owen oh, rewinds. His motor function went to hell with one exception, the thumb on the rewind button. His brother taught him how to use it. Rewind. Second time. Rewinds. Walter's like, oh, and just watch the movie. Third rewind. Cornelia grabs me and goes, it's not juice. What? It's not juice. It's, it's just. Just. I grab Owen. Just your voice. He looks at me and goes, juice your voice. Juice your voice. Juice your voice. The first time he looks at me in a, in a year. And we just start jumping on the bed. Walter's going, oh, it's talking again. Cornelius, of course, is just going, bawling. We go to our brilliant Alan Rosenblatt the next day. We say, we had a Helen Keller moment, as we called it. Water, you know. He's like, okay, sit down. This is a little complicated. Uh, well, we have a word for this. This is called echolalia. Cornelius goes, oh, I don't like the sound of that word. He's like, you know, when I tell you, you're going to like it less. It's, look, uh, their motor function as well as their auditory processing go haywire. It's almost certain he has no idea what he's saying. <gasps> How do you know? Well, this is what we believe. Echo like a parrot. Yeah. So that's where we end up. Years. Four years. Between a pet store and Helen Keller. Other words come. Next year... Booty lies Witten. Booty lies Witten. Okay. Booty lies Witten. Anybody? Come on. 1992. What's the next movie in this procession? What? Beauty. Well, may, no. I'm going to get another one. What? Beauty lies within. What do we have for our contestants, Johnny, in the back? <laughs> That's right. We go back to Rosenblatt. Okay, okay. If it's all gibberish to him, how is he picking those three words out of 89 minutes of gibberish? No way of knowing. He's six and a half. He's up to a three-word sentence. Cornelia works morning, noon, and night. We borrowed money from everyone we can. Three words, I want juice. And that's progress. We're feeling like he can at least verbalize basic needs. He's watching a lot of movies. Now, you've met Owen, you've met me, you've met Cornelia. Key actor not yet really noticed. Key actor in many of these dramas, as our wonderful Rachel said, sibling, Walter. This is the undiscovered country in these conversations of ability versus disability and even drawing that line, which is not easy. The sibling, you know, we're going to die. We're parents. He grows up with Owen, side by side. And he will be with Owen through the whole life journey, right to the finish. The key actor. Well, Walter at nine is already a junior adult. Nothing he needs, nothing he asks for. We have stories about Walter. So much of this, like everything we do, is about story. We craft these stories to make sense of ourselves and our place in the world. It's exactly what we do as journalists in public. We do in private. That's personal narrative. Tell me your story. Yours. Tell me your story. Most of us can do that. What's our story for Walter? The junior adult. Nothing he can't handle. First day of school, first grade, Walter's six years old. The onset of autism is about a year, year and a half in, and five blocks away from the school, Owen, Cornelia, and Walter in the car. Walter says, um, I'm good. You can leave me here. Cornelia's like, what are you talking about? It's the first day of school. You, they know you have parents. This isn't Dickens. <laughs> Walter's like, I'm good. This is good. I'm good. I'm good. And he goes, that Walter, he needs nothing. And he rides his bike to school almost a mile. Even in the winter. Well, that's Walter. Like the small Jewish Marine. And he hits the beach and feels guilty later. So it was our story. 
story we told. But key, two parts. Nothing can phase Walter. A, B, and he will never leave his little brother behind, ever. Two things. So we don't even really notice that Walter gets a little weepy on one day of the year. And he guesses what day? Come on. His birthday. You got it. See? You see, part of that's really important, though. Because, you know, the fact is, once you live inside of characters, some of these things you're going to hit right on the bell. And you ask them. Right. Correct. We're all identical in all of the essential ways. We are. We all basically want the same things, and we want to find a way to get them. Despite all the things that divide us and separate us and distinguish us, deep in the human core, we are virtually indistinguishable from each other. So, on Walter's ninth birthday, when I went to six and a half and up to a three-word sentence, and we're happy at least about that, though Cornelia hasn't slept in four years, Walt's in the backyard, and he gets a little weepy when the other kids take off. And Owen's back there with him, running around, doing voices, whatever he's doing. And then Owen follows us into the kitchen. And we turn around, he's standing there, looking at us with intensity. We're like, what's up? What's it with me? What's it, Cornelia? Back and forth. And he says, Walter doesn't want to grow up like Mowgli or Peter Pan. And off he goes. It's like a thunderbolt went through the kitchen. We're like, ah, what's that? What happened? Full sentence, first. And something we didn't even notice. Pattern recognition. Think of that term. I'll come back to it later. He sees everything at once. Finds patterns. Autistic spectrum disorders. Or strengths, depending on your point of view. So, of course, Cornelia and I struck silent, begin talking furiously. We talk for four hours straight. We can't stop talking, at which point she's like, this is really great, but I'm exhausted because i got to get up in the morning, and I've been up every night for four years. So you're the crazy one. You dress as a clown at Walter's five-year-old birthday party, wear a propeller hat, find a way back in there. For a husband, this is the moment where you attempt to lift a Volkswagen. <laughs> so I'm like, got it. So up I go to the bedroom. Owen is up at the landing of an attic where Walter and Owen share. Walt's downstairs, so I got Owen alone, and I crawl up the steps, and I see in the landings a puppet, a puppet I know he loves. It's Yago from Aladdin. You know that character, right? Gilbert Gottfried. I grab the puppet. I pull it on my arm. It's one of those big $98 plush toys. We've taken out a second mortgage to buy Disney crap. We have everything they sell. So all Owen likes. All Owen will respond to. And I'm there and saying, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? I crawl across the floor quietly. Owen's on the bed looking at a Disney book, picture book. He can't read, of course, but he loves the pictures. And I crawl as quietly as I can. I don't want him to look at me. Not that big a deal. He's not going to look anyway. But I'm very quiet. It takes about six minutes to cut across the rug. And I'm against the bed, right up hard. And I throw the bedspread over my head. I push the puppet up through the bedspread's crease. And in Gilbert's voice, I say, Owen, Owen, how does it feel to be you? Owen turns to the puppet like he's bumping into an old friend. And he says, not good. I have no friends. And I'm lonely. And then we talk. I mean, I bite down hard. I'm like, don't give in to emotion here. Just stay in character. What would Yago say next? OK, when did you and I become such good friends? When I watched Aladdin, you made me laugh. And, and then we're off. We talk for almost two minutes straight. Our first conversation. And then I hear Owen clear his throat. And now it's up high because he's only six and a half. <clears throat> and then he says, I love the way your foul little mind works. <laughs> you know who that is? That's Jafar, the villain. Yago is the sidekick to Jafar. This is the next line of dialogue. That's our breakthrough. 
I, of course, jump out from under the bedspread, and I'm up, and I'm like, ah, Owen, we're talking in dialogue. Our house is turned upside down. We start what we call the basement sessions, and every night we play out scenes. There, look, there's Owen has memorized, we soon realize, 50 animated movies since Snow White in 1937. They've made 50 of them. I've got a graduate degree from here, but now I get a PhD in Disney. There's something in every one of those movies there to use. And the first night, we do Jungle Book. He's into Jungle Book. And what we do is, is we have the TV ready. Because you throw him a line, he'll throw you back to the next line. You'll throw him the next line, he'll throw you back to the next line. He's going to outrun you quick. So we have the TV to refresh ourselves. Okay, well, just stay there a minute. Okay, what's the next scene? Okay, okay, okay honey, you, you're Bagheera. That's Sebastian Cabot, the panther, remember? I'm Baloo, Walt's King Louie, you know, secret of man's red fire, man cub. And Owen, of course, is Mowgli. We do this through the night, this first night. A ways in, <laughs> at one point, as Baloo, I say, you know, you'd make one great bear. It's Phil Harris. And Owen says, you think so, Papa Bear? And he hugs me. And I'm not sure if it's Mowgli and Baloo or me and Owen. And of course Cornelius says, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. And it didn't. And so then we're off. What happens in these years to come? Well, he gets his speech back over years by us doing dialogue. You know, there's something for every occasion. In the morning, he's got a job to walk the dog. Annie, what movie do we go with? Come on. We do one Dalmatians, of course. We do a little scene. He's good. At night, he's got to go to bed. We need a scene with sleep. Anyone? Dumbo? Sleeping in the tree? I got to do the crows. I won't do that here. He goes to sleep. He learns to read credits, learns to read by reading the credits. He didn't read, but the credits, motivation is tapped. By the time we get forward, when he's 11, almost 12 years old, he is creating an emotional language using 100 plus hours of Disney dialogue and lyric. He is speaking in this voice. So, in the world of narrative, where are we? Well, I'm trying to write books to use the model I used in Hope in the Unseen on the field of power. It's working sort of. So in 2004, I read a book called The Price of Loyalty where I bagged a guy named Paul O'Neill, who was a treasury secretary. I'm trying to use my good enough reasons rules. Up there, at the, the cloud city of message, where message matters, where message is all we do. Jump back. Anyone hear of Walter Pincus in this room? Great Washington Post investigative reporter. Walter and I are on a panel together. He says a brilliant thing about narrative, about how it's grown, how message has grown like a kudzu in the realm of power. Lovely. He says, you know, Ron, and Walter was old then. He's older now. He says, you know, we didn't always have a slug every day for POTUS. You know, if the president didn't do something interesting, we didn't write about him. The Washington Post. I said, really? When did that change? Uh, when that uh, Reagan, that Deaver guy, what a brilliant guy. Brilliant. Yeah, so what he figured out is that all the three network news shows had 22 and a half minutes to fill and they needed pictures. All right? So every day Reagan did something. He could have just busted the air traffic controllers, but he was at a union plant. Hugging a guy from a union. Didn't matter. Picture. Didn't matter what the words were. Didn't matter what the policy was. There's Reagan. Hell, yeah. There you go. It's my friend. Yeah. 
And all of a sudden, every day, the papers were writing a POTUS story. Whatever he did, they wrote about it. Turn. Go back to 1960s. Remember the newspaper strike? Go look at the studies. You study it here at Columbia. We used to. When the newspapers went on strike, CBS, NBC, and ABC, the reports were all over the place when the Times was on strike. They didn't know what was most important. They didn't know what came first. Some led with a story. The others didn't even have it. That's then. And what you had at the New York Times in those days is you had a team of people who were trained to exercise discretion to say that's not important and that is. And that was a very, very complex equation at the 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock meetings at the New York Times that shaped what the public decided was important. Just like Walter Cronkite at his news meeting. And then message grows and grows and grows to a point where a president is criticized for being off message. Like, message is above him. How did that happen? That's where we are in this period. So what do you need to crack it? You need a whistleblower. You need somebody who will embrace truth even when truth is out of fashion. This ends up being Paul Henry O'Neill. The Treasury Secretary. First two years under George W. Bush. Truth. Is there a market for it? I say to O'Neill in our first meeting, I say, um, you have documents, right? And you've got a schedule. Yeah, I have a schedule. I said, you're a believer in transparency. Yeah, yeah. I know when you ran Alcoa, you were crazy about that. Can I have your schedule? You bet. 7,830 entries. Every single meeting, every phone call as Treasury Secretary for two years. And remember, he's on the National Security Council as Treasury Secretary. Then I say, are there documents? Uh, yeah, yeah. Before and after every meeting, there's documents created. Uh, and then you know, they're updated at the end of the day. Where are they now? O'Neill had been fired after two years. I see him right after he's fired. Well, they're back at Treasury, Ron. I said, that's a problem. Yeah, that's a problem. After various twists and turns, a couple months later, O'Neill calls me. He says, I was at Treasury today, and uh, I was talking to the general counsel, David Offhauser, and I told him, you're doing a book where I'm the protagonist. It's your book, it's not mine, but you need documents. And I, I said to David, uh, you know, what can I get? And David says, I don't know, let me check. David checked. He says, well, apparently you're entitled to everything that's not stamp classified. I mean, Jim Baker's got boxes in his damn garage. So he gives O'Neill a disc. O'Neill calls me in the spring, 2003. He says, I got something for you. He says, I'm going back to Pittsburgh where he lived in a big baronial house. He was the Alcoa CEO. But I'll leave it for you with... Um, um, I'm not making this up, the security guard at the Watergate. I'm like, you're kidding. Yeah, he'll, he's a nice guy. He'll have it. 30 years, we're right back. I get the disc. There's 19,000 documents on it. <laughs> Big, lovely, uniformed African-American guy gave it to me. He said, bless you. And uh, at that point, I accepted Jesus as my personal savior. I hugged him <laughs> in. I'm so happy. Of course, that book comes out a year later. The reason the book had heft is because when you have a document with someone's name at the top, you have a lead on them, an advantage. So when I call up Colin Powell or anyone else, I say, look, I got the document right here. Okay, well, let's make sure what you get is right then, at least. Are we off the record? Yes. Two stories side by side. At this point, Owen has been thrown out of the precious, desired school in Washington, D.C. called the Lab School of Washington. Okay? They mostly have LD kids, a few autistic spectrum kids. They basically say the autistic spectrum kids are too hard to educate, and out he goes. He is bruised by this. He is 11, almost 12, and he cannot tell us how he feels. He doesn't have that much speech. But we can tell he's really wrecked. 
you know, they have a graduation ceremony, and they're all moving up to the middle school. He's been there five years, except Owen. So Owen actually wears the, a mortar board and gets a diploma as the graduate, you know, trumpeting his graduation from the lower school. It's awful. He's not fooled by this. Cornelia has a whole day planned for him. Ice cream in the video store. And, uh, and he's saying, no, no, I'm fine. I'll go to the basement. I have movies I need to watch. And that's what he does. He goes down there and he begins drawing furiously, wildly, with incredible intensity. We got Disney animation books, and he finds in those books a face that matches what he feels, and he draws it precisely, just like an animator. I don't see it for a couple months. He's down there working on a project. I'm like, what's going on? And I go down, and I grab the first book, 100 pages. There were 100 pictures of sidekicks, all sidekicks, no heroes. We hoped he wouldn't see what the world saw of him. But now he did, and he felt it. He was not a hero. He was a sidekick and discarded. And he lives in a place, as he says, among the sidekicks. We said, what's a sidekick? Ex explain, define. And he got it from one of those making of movies, you know, online, the making of a movie. He says, a sidekick helps the hero fulfill his destiny. That's their job. Hmm. He becomes an aficionado of hundreds of them in Disney. Some are goofy, some are wise, some are resourceful. He's an expert. He gives sidekick identities to kids at a school, the school he went to with the Down Syndrome kid. He's back there now. And he says, this one is actually funny. And he's like this sidekick. And this one is like Scuttle. He's kind of clever uh, and lighthearted. And me too. The end of this first book with all those sidekicks drawn. Sidekicks like Sebastian. When Ariel loses her voice, that face of fear. Ten times. He writes two things. One, I am the protector of the sidekicks. And the last thing he writes is no sidekick gets left behind. He has a measurable IQ of 74. To put an IQ score in a kid like that, there should be a law against that. But it gives everyone an excuse to say, he doesn't know what he's saying. We don't buy it. How would he write that? That's the challenge you face. Trusting yourself. Trusting what you know. I'm sure of this. What's happening around that time? Well, we're all sidekicks. He gives us all sidekicks' identity. Cornelia is often, uh, well, there's a lot of women. Walt killed all the women. I don't know what's up with that, but there's no women in there. So uh, she's either uh, uh, Mrs. Potts or Big Mama from Fox and the Hound. That's Pearl Bailey. The, the wisest and gentlest of the lady sidekicks. And I am, on a good year, I'm Merlin or Rafiki. That shows that's been a good year for me. In early 2004, with all those 19,000 documents for George W. Bush, something occurs. I'm running into the methodologies of message. I, of course, have in the price of loyalty that the Iraq war is not a seed or incented or created by 9-11. From the first National Security Council meeting of the Bush presidency, it was about entering Iraq, find me an excuse. From the first meeting, it's a document. I don't have classified documents. But in the disk that O'Neill gives me, they cleaned off the documents but left the cover sheets. You can tell a lot from a cover sheet. And there it is, cover sheet. Three, executive summary, political military plan for post-Iraq Saddam crisis. It's on 60 Minutes on Sunday night. I tell Leslie Stahl, say I don't have the document. That gets cut. It's Monday morning after 60 Minutes on Sunday. The phone rings in my kitchen. I'm on uh, Terry Gross, uh, the NPR show. I love her. And uh, Cornelia answers. It's a guy named Jeffrey Rush. 
an inspector general of the Treasury Department. And he says, hi, this is Jeffrey Rush, Inspector General of Treasury on behalf of the Inspectors General at CIA, Defense, and State. Your husband is under federal investigation. We're going to send some people by. We have apparently some documents in the office behind your house to seize the, the documents. Cornelia, of course, says, I am not married. I've never heard of Ron Susskind. <laughs> in fact, in fact, Cornelia is ready. Now, what? I'm Jewish. She's Irish. So there are some cultural distinctions. When I get challenged, my first response is usually uh, neurosis and self-blame. Hers is Irish. Excuse me? You're talking to me? <laughs> this is how they survive for a thousand years on the rocky coast. And, and this clarity of purpose has been schooled by 10 years in the defense of Owen Suskind, mind you. So she's muscled up. And she said, Mr. Rush, let me just stop you there. When last I checked, my husband was a journalist. Okay, he's protected by the First Amendment. No one's coming to my house. Let's be clear about that. And she says, but, you know, all sweetness and light, if you give me your phone number, I'm sure I can have him call you. Later, Rush apparently told someone, what was with the wife? She killed me. That creates months of true panic in the Susskind household. I don't know if any of you here have been under federal investigation. Have, have you been under federal investigation? No. No, no, no. Yeah, I didn't think so. Um, uh, you know, it's bracing. You know, Wilmer Cutler first said they might handle me. The lawyers who called them back first were Wilmer, but then I lost in front of the pro bono committee there for I don't know why, and Covington and Burling swept in, thank God, because you cannot fight the federal government. They will bleed you to death in 30 seconds. So we're in this tense period. Now, on every birthday, every Father's or Mother's Day, Owen, of course, draws a card for us, a flawlessly rendered version of a sidekick with some script. Father's Day of this year, 2004, while we're under federal investigation, Owen gives me a picture of Long John Silver from Treasure Planet. I'm like, what's this? He's like, you're kind of a pirate now, aren't you? I said, yes. But with a heart of gold, yeah, yeah. You bet, tell your mother. We don't think he knows what's happening. He does. Jump ahead two leaps, and then we'll get to questions. When Owen's 14 and Walter's 17, Owen is still in the world of sidekicks. We're all sidekicks with him. The only person drawn as a hero on his birthday, in his card, he's Simba, he's Aladdin, is Walter. He actually is the protector of the sidekicks. And so when Owen is going on about hand-drawn animation, wanting to come back, because it's better, it's got more heart, the computer animated stuff isn't as good, since Toy Story in 1995, they don't earn their emotions like I do when I draw. Walt's like, Owen, oh, let me explain this to you. We try to cut Walter off. Owen, oh, don't worry. Hand-drawn animation will come back. We're parents. We're idiots. You bet. Don't you worry. Owen knows it won't. He trolls the internet all day. Walt's like, Owen, oh, let me level with you. Ever since Toy Story, hand-drawn is toast. You know, it takes four years to draw those pictures. They do a computer animated movie in six months. They, they put out three a week. Owen's oh, face falls. And Walt says, um, listen, buddy, if you want this animation to come back to hand drawing, you've got to lead the charge. You've got to step up. <gasps> and they're like, what, 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 Walter, what are you doing? No, no, listen to me. Don't listen to them. Come on, you've been watching these movies since you're a little peanut. You got any ideas in there? It's a dinner. We're all silent. Owen gets the look, the same look he got in the kitchen at six and a half with Mowgli and Peter Pan, not wanting to grow up. And he gets his like bubble up look, and he goes, I do have a one idea. Okay. Um, 12 sidekicks searching uh, for a hero. And in their journey and in the obstacles they face, each finds the hero. Uh, within themselves. And we all clink glasses to Owen's movie. It's called Sidekicks. It will be produced at the end of a documentary that will be out in movie theaters next year. 
by Roger Williams, a brilliant, wonderful Academy Award winning director of documentaries. And at the end of what I hear, they will animate sidekicks. It's a fully realized story at the end of Life Animated. Owen wrote it. It's the story of his life using animated characters. Final skip ahead. Those big books, those big doorstops on presidents and power, America's role in the world, I mean, like, I felt they worked. I'd mix the famous and powerful with an ensemble of real people, like Cedric Jennings. They have different names, different types of people. Uh, Usman Kosa from Pakistan who gets interrogated under the White House. The Way of the World. Book about America's loss of moral authority in the world. Ibrahim, uh, uh, you know, who is a guy from Afghanistan. Characters who are real people living real lives. But the fact is, is that there was news in those books, and the news was so noisy in a tendentious period, they mostly eclipsed the wider stories that were found in the conversation between real people and real lives and the brittle world of message and senior officials who said, I can't tell you what I believe because no one believes in truth now. My response to them, where I got them to tell me certain things, as Rachel says, was truth is all you got. It's the only thing that works in your miserable life. The only thing that works in your relationship with your wife, your, your kids, whoever you work with, you've got to trust it. It's messy. It's not controllable. It's like a wind. But it's all we have at the end of the day. You know that. I see this over and over again until sometimes they give. And then they say it. This is the most seminal thing I know. And then I work them, I walk them up to the shoreline. I tell them all about what's in the book for the most part, you know, how this will be in the book. Hey, you said that to me about a year ago. Do you, you still feel that? I can't change it, but I can add to it. If you change your mind, no, okay. And then they step out into the hot lights of Kill or Be Killed. Oh, it's ugly. It's ugly. The beginning, sometimes they're told, hey, this is on tape, right? Oh, Jesus. Listen, you can lie now if you want. Don't worry about it. Just say it's out of context. Say you said the opposite. Don't worry. The way it works now is that when that, that spasm of coverage hits and when all the hits from the news site go online, hit it, we want you to kick up a little bit of dust. That's the key. At the beginning, the first two days. You know the rule. No scandal lasts more than 48 hours. Except a couple. Rare. Kick up dust for two days. It could be nonsense. It doesn't matter. And it'll stick. Same thing people used to complain about in the old days, saying, hey, you killed me on the front page of the New York Times, and the correction was back in B12. No different. Different tactics, different expression of them. Sometimes people get to the characters like Cedric, or like Owen, for that matter, who carry the seed of the wider human narrative. Sometimes they don't. And then finally, at the end of the day, I come back to this book. Because I was beaten up, I was tired. Four straight books. Terrific. They debut at one, two, or three in the New York Times list. Everyone's delighted. They weren't lasting as long as I hoped. People discover them later. Oh, this is not about, I thought this was not about, this is about a bigger thing. Yeah, yeah. And mostly I was just tired. Owen had grown up. He was 19. He said, look, you're a journalist, and mom, you're reporters. I, I want people to know who I am, and people like me. I said, okay, well, let me talk to your mother. And Cornelia and I sat around, and we said, oh, yeah, what do you think? Should we do something? He always lived a private life. I was the public guy. They weren't. She's like, oh, gosh, you know, would a book about what's happened here, would it help 
us? Would it have helped us 15 years ago when we were just living in terror and despair? Yeah, probably. So we did it. So now you've got this extraordinary combination of Owen and Cedric Jennings from A Hope in the Unseen kind of walking side by side on the landscape of narrative. Now you understand it. No $22 words in that book. Twists and turns. Owen feeling his way, us in moments of darkness. Utterly naked. I had to turn the lights on myself and my family. It wasn't just the subjects anymore, it was us. And use the same rules. It was painful. Cornelia was brilliant. She said, this is gonna be hard, but here's the key. I will be brutal with you, and you will be brutal with me. You will hold nothing back, okay? How about Walt? Well, you gotta debrief him. You gotta treat him like a source holding a classified document. And Walt was quite courageous at 25. This wasn't on his schedule. He's out working for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the Elizabeth Warren Agency. He's got a life. He came up. He said, all right, throw them at me. I said, well, you're going to have to tell me things that you wouldn't want to tell me, everything. Stuff no kid would want to tell his dad. Just hold nothing back. Okay, Jewish Marine. He crushes me. That's why, as Rachel says, Walt is arguably the most powerful character in the book because he's one of you for the most part. Some people here are in this needs and special needs or or special difference community. Walt, Walt, Walt lived undetected in the wider world. He left every morning, he goes out there, he's got a million friends, he's president of the class, he's captain of the football team. Then he comes back to Crazy House. So Walt is the one who makes the choices. We make choices, but Walt had to make a lot of them as Owen's partner, and he makes the choices. Admirably and beautifully. At the end, he says, well, the thing I just told you, I got it from him. At the end, he tells his camp, they didn't know about Owen. Walt thrives at this camp so powerfully in an Owen free zone. Where was it? What's he missing at home? And at 22, he's now a counselor, and he, he says, it's time you knew about the best teacher I ever had. He's different but he's made me different. I know more about Disney movies than the people who made the damn movies. You know, what Owen accomplishes in a day is more than I do in a month. It makes all the things that hit me, challenge me, seem small, manageable. I wouldn't be who I am today if he's not who he is. Oh, people say, right, right, right. That's the blessing in disguise. And Walt says something quite powerful. He says, there's nothing disguised about it. It's simply our inability to see something that is plain as day. That plain as day is at the core of all the things that people loved about my life. And now it's clear. Sweet are the uses of adversity. Shakespeare says it right in the head. First time I heard that was Sam Irvin talking about the Watergate crisis. It's on PBS when I was in high school. They said, Senator Irvin, head of the committee. Senator Irvin, what do you think is the legacy of Watergate? Well, I talk about my, my friend, Mr. Shakespeare. He said, sweet are the uses of adversity. And then he says the second part, which is the better part, from As You Like It. He says, Adversity, like the toad, ugly and venomous, bears a jewel in its forehead. Narratives of hope, where the hope is earned and earned hard, page by page, paragraph by paragraph, are, are stories of finding the jewel. That means you've got to embrace the adversity and you've got to see it for what it is. You've got to break through the stereotypes. You've got to say they're just like me. Let me find that. 
Let them surprise me. If I'm saying, oh, perfect, this will get them right to the conclusion I want, and the reader will cry, oh, perfect for what? That's not the place you should be. Follow them. Learn from them. Seek the jewel. It's what human beings do all the time. And that's why we're not cardboard cutouts. That's why we all have this heart and this soul, and we all live the life together in this glorious present. When my father says live the worthwhile life, that's as close as I'm going to get. And that's why I think the people who do this, even though you're not going to get rich, and you're not going to have power in the traditional financial ways, you're going to have a different kind of power. You're going to have a power as the teller of stories in this time. And that's real power. So anyone who does this or loves it, I just want to say thanks for listening and coming out tonight. Thank you. Okay, look, we got at least 15 minutes for questions. I mean, I go late. I go, but 15 minutes, we're up to our 8 o'clock deadline. You got it? Oh, good. Okay, so you're going to... Oh, this is good. Okay, this is a video of us, and you'll see here how Owen channels the voices. Now, this is going to show him in present tense. He's living an independent life now, supported independent living. Mind you, he's just like a thousand other kids. Don't think he's different. One in a million, he's a million in a million. I see kids with neurodivergent, ADHD, autism, all sorts of things. What am I looking for? The compensatory strengths. It's no different from Stevie Wonder or Ray Charles. They're blind. They can do anything with sound. When part of us is stressed, the brain finds a way. No different. Neuroplasticity. You've heard that term. So the question is, where is the strength? Owen found his affinity with Disney. I have kids in every walk of life who are saying, this is what I'm great at. I'm not good at the one-size-fits-all thing at school, but watch what I can do. And that's what you see here as he channels voices and describes his relationship to his father. And he kills me off midway. So watch for that. You just saw it. You were in the shoes of that character. That's what we do as journalists. Owen's doing it on the screen. Feel it, live it, see it. Questions? Come on. You're, it's Columbia. Yeah, yeah. What's your name? Here, why don't you take that? Okay. Hi. Okay, um, you can hear me. Go ahead, Karina. Yes, I'm Karina. I'm a student in Professor Adams's class. Mm -hmm. um, so I just read Life Animated and really loved it. Um, and uh, in our class, we've talked a bit about this sort of ethical question of what responsibility do people have to their families and loved ones around them when they write a memoir, especially one that's not about themselves. So I was wondering if you could speak to um, you know, how you work through that challenge for yourself, the question of what parts to include, what parts to leave out, and how your family, especially Cornelia um, and Walton Owen as well, you know, how, what role they played in, in that yeah. process. Yeah, well, it's a great question. It was a challenge from the start. I mean, I have long told sources that I need to know everything. Um, what I would say to them is that um, this good enough reasons rule is such that people know their own life and if we don't see your good enough reason, i.e. if something's missing, they won't know what it is necessarily, but a spell of sorts will be broken and you will not reach off the page. So now I had to apply that to us. And the key was Cornelia is, is more than a match for me and is brilliant on narrative. And we just killed each other to get to everything, to not hold anything pertinent back. Really, and we didn't. The, the trick, were to, well, Owen was a great asset because he's got this memory that a lot of Spectrum kids have, which is stunning. He can remember what you're wearing 10 years ago on Tuesday, and if it was blue or green. So Owen, at a key moment, uh, opened up a kind of, you know, uh, 
sort of figuratively speaking, a kind of two-sided book and, and showed us the matrix. It was when he was about 19 between the wonderful world of Disney and what movies he saw at certain times and how he used those movies to make sense of what's happening in our real life, which he knew in detail better than we did. That was crucial in terms of writing the book. I mean, as a reporter, it was heaven. We had a lot of documents. We talked to a lot of people. But that was one of the key things, Owen's memory. Cornelia's got a great memory. Walt's got a great memory. And we laid it down. When we first went out to start writing the book, though, we laid down our whole life in a timeline in this writer's studio that we had at this fellowship, Cornelia and I. And we just tried to plot it out. And what's interesting is that we realized that, okay, here's a key moment in terms of the writing, is that we had to feel what we felt at the time we felt it. So we had to essentially relive our life. You know, oh, oh no, that was the bad day. No, no, up ahead was the worst day. No, remember then, and Owen through the stool. And, and it was incredibly emotional. I mean, so much so I was just feeling a little unglued. Cornelia was helpful. She's like, no, this is good emotion. This is progress. You know, I felt like I should go to a war zone just to limber up. And, and then at the end, something, a twist occurred, which was crucial, is that I brought in a friend of mine, Greg Jackson, who's a great uh, novelist, nonfiction writer, or a fiction writer now. He's my assistant for Way of the World. And we talked, and Cornelia kind of set the thing up a little bit. And I was having trouble because I was looking back as I wrote and I had the, the knowledge of hindsight. And it was mucking it up. I was kind of saying why something's important all the time. I was, I was abrogating my rules is what I was doing. I write these books in present tense. I love present tense. You know, we've had battles with it. Alice May, who I love, and editor Simon Schuster, great editor. You know, at one point she's like, no, you got to write it in past tense. And I wrote some in past tense. It'll have more weight, more gravity. I'm like, yeah, but Hope in the Unseen is written in present tense. So you're living what the characters live as they live it. I love that. You got to get a lot of detail in, but the emotions are authentic and not intermediated by you. So at that moment, as we talked, I realized I've got to read. I'd written some already. It wasn't. It was terrible. Cornelia, like, tried to tell me. Like, this is not any good. Just painful for a wife. And then I went to present tense, and everything worked. The key other final actor was Walter. When Walt comes up, I've got to really grill him. And he was quite courageous. You know, he said, you know that thing about the car? Five blocks away from school, first day. He's like, all oh, right. Like, for instance, that was a story you and mom loved to tell, the story of Walter, right? Yeah, I heard that about a thousand times. What the deal was is that it was just me, mom, and Owen in the car. And uh, if she brought me in for the first day of first grade, she'd have to bring Owen. And it would be about what's going on with your brother, what's he doing? You know, a six-year-old boy's dad can be a cruel bunch. I knew that. And I want to be about that. And so then I ride my bike every day. That's what's really going on. That's the way it worked. You know, I was fearful, anyone would be, about the reaction, what will happen when everyone's out in public, utterly exposed. But I have to say, a year along now, just shy of a year, it's been an extraordinary time for us, the whole family, where we trusted truth, I guess, and it worked. Another Thanks. question, yeah. Hi, um, I'm Hannah. I'm also a student in Professor Adams' class, um, yeah. and I'm also a creative writing student. And I was wondering what advice you might have for someone um, who's looking to write a memoir of their own. Hmm. Well, you know, memoirs are really hard. You know, let's find the ones we think manage it. It's like you can count them on one hand. You know, if I point people to some that I liked, I mean, Russell Baker's memoir was fabulous. You know, Russell Baker was a great writer. Uh, I mean, you can count them on one hand. They're hard. I would say this. I would say that you've got to do uh, what will feel like an unnatural thing, which is you have to imagine, in essence, that you're dead. Sorry. You've got to float over yourself, like Mark Twain's or whatever, Letters from Earth, you know, that kind of notion and just sort of look down, a little bit of a George Bailey thing. 
and just say, hmm, who is this person? What's she feeling? Um, you can't be self-congratulatory even when you deserve it for the most part. If the reader comes to that, fine. Um, they're watching for that. Um, you tend not to probably congratulate yourself too much anyway. And most of us don't. Um, you've got to uh, bear the most intimate parts of yourself if it's going to work. If you don't want to do that, you probably shouldn't do one. You know, the reader will demand it. The best parts of the book are the ones where in our dialogue, me and Cornelia, I look like an idiot. Well, Cornelia is in despair. The reader just, they're like, okay, this is the real thing. Check the box. This is their real life. So that's what I tell you. Yeah. I know I'm going like the three of you here. Sorry, I'll move around. and Oh, oh, it's like Mount Rushmore. I'll move around in a minute. Hi, my name is Fabiana. It's a pleasure. I'm mm -hmm. Brazilian, so forgive my English. Um, you just said that memories can be very painful, and they usually are. But they are also so much like a therapy. Yeah. And what's the, what was the good thing that visiting all these memories again mm -hmm. since Owen was born yeah. till now, yeah. what's the best part of it for your family as a group that, is, that are together in a journey? Yeah. That's a great question. I mean, I think it's, it's sweet uses of adversity. I mean, we, we ended up being able to look at ourselves uh, with, um, with a kind of distance you know, you get up close. I've lived in this skin, after all. But being able to sort of see us, I guess, in context. I used to, it's funny, when you hear echoes of what I used to say to sources, I'm saying in a different way, where I would say to them, look, you want to be known as who you are in context, right? Isn't that what everyone wants? And they're like, yeah, that works. And so we end up seeing ourselves, I think, in context um, as confused, searching, yearning, heart aching, sometimes grabbing it and making it humans. Um, what's interesting about it now is that as Owen and Walter get interviewed, and they have been interviewed a lot, we actually see them a little differently, which is fascinating. Again, it's like an echo chamber of all the 30 years that preceded, it, where I can hear voices from them that I don't hear otherwise as they talk publicly wild. So all that is the good part. Yeah? A, a two-part uh, question in a way is it seems as if um, your uh, journalism is to uh, find the truth that you quite know. And, and the upshot seems to be that I want to make a contribution, but there's no... Oh, yeah. Well, why just start over because they want to get it on the camera. Set the up the, the, the journalistic task seems to be to uh, establish a truth that you're vague about. And, and uh, the, uh, what you seem to find from listening to you is that Owen is, uh, can make a contribution, as well as uh, any other human being That's can right. make a contribution. And um, I couldn't help but think of, um, I'm actually almost embarrassed, because I know that um, during World War II, there was a program in which the disabled were given work. Mm -hmm. I actually only know it. I don't even know what agency it worked through, but I know that from work reading uh, Francis Perkins's uh, memoirs, yeah. you know, FDR had something to do with it, and he would call her periodically right. and say, "How yep. are the disabled people doing?" You know, yeah. and uh, that seems unique in a way because um, I don't know that there was such a program and work programs like the WPA. There might have been. I know that they. Uh, was was the, <laughs> I know that they taught people how to work, but I don't know if they actually had a a program for the disabled, because that would be more expensive than actually just aiding them. Yeah. But it recognizes that they have a contribution to make. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? And yeah. We seem so far away from uh, <laughs> anything like well, that. Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, what I find hopeful, if, you, if I dare say such a word, is, um, is this kinship between Cedric Jennings and Owen that people sometimes recognize. Because both of them are in the discard pile, for the most part. 
Cedric, inner city African American kid. He's got a 910 combined SAT score. He's not, well, someone who people expect a lot from. He lives in a war zone. Expectations are blunted. And then Owen. Now they're, they're different. Owen is neurologically distinctive. I think differently abled is an accurate term. Cedric is disenfranchised by poverty and race. But they're not at the table and not expected to ever be at the table. Okay. Now, when you look at the issue of differently abled, that's a term, Perkins might have interesting insights into this, but that's a term that I always felt as kind of a PC term early on when I first heard it, like, eh, and I tend to recoil from PC terminologies, which I've gotten over. And, <laughs> but the fact is that it's accurate. Just to understand the parallel, Owen uses his affinity to make his way in the world. It's not the accepted and <laughs> validated one-size-fits-all model that many of us triumphed on in our schooling. You can't do that. For him, the teacher is like Charlie Brown's teacher. Well, want, want Charlie Brown. He can't hear it. Cedric, in Hope in the Unseen, has a moment that's different but not that different where he is at Brown University and he is hanging by a thread after an extraordinary passage from the blighted urban terrain on prayers and cheers, one kid in a decade to make it to the Ivy League. He is hanging by a thread his second semester. You see, here's the connection, okay? And uh, he's got to write a double-spaced, 10-page paper with footnotes, bloodless academic on heterogeneous and homogeneous grouping. Okay, for his education seminar, upper level. Okay, he goes to a blighted school in Providence, very much like the school he came up through, Baloo. What he sees, though, deeply troubles him and it outrages him. There are a couple Portuguese kids flow up and black and Latino flow left into the abyss. He's like, I've lived that. I'm still living it. Outrages him. So here he is, the night before it's due. The whole saga of hope hanging by a thread. Cedric writes, not a temp he doesn't know how to do that page. He's never done it. Neuroplasticity, his brain wasn't formed to be able to do that paper. He's no experience doing it. Inputs that shape our brain didn't have them. He lived in a place of crowd control. And so what does he do? Instead of writing the paper, which every time he tries, he says, it's lame, it's lame. It doesn't do justice to what I know that I've earned insights he writes a 68-line epic poem instead. Okay. Here's the challenge, everyone in the room. He hands it in the next day. The teacher looks at it and goes, oi, oi, oi. <laughs> a week passes. He hands back the papers. <laughs> he says, Cedric, would you please come to my office? Cedric goes to his office. He's not breathing at this point. He's actually not respiring, and the teacher sits him down and goes, okay, look, uh, Larry Wakeford, look, you may not know this, but you've got kind of lucky break with me. You see, I'm not really a Brown professor. I'm the vice principal of a school in inner city Cincinnati. I got a whole school full of kids like you, and you know, if, if we have passion and personal testimony on the SATs, you get 800s on that part. I, I know who you are. And listen, this poem is brilliant. It's brilliant. Here's this passage outraged, looking at the color coding of the kids. He says, yes, red, yellow, and orange will do, but something's still missing to create the perfect view. Looking at the same hues is really no fun. Maybe I'll just let the colors run. It's good. He explains a complex educational theme in rhyme. He, he manages it. So Wakeford goes, I'm going to give you a B minus on this. I could get fired for this. You didn't get permission. It's not even close. But here's the deal. You're going to have to come see me, and we're going to have to talk here, because your outrage and your earned insights from what you embrace are real. But you've got to put that outrage in a place where it doesn't bleed over everything. You've got to step back from it, and you've got to try to do it a little more the way we want it done here at Brown as an academic, as a scholar. Step back from your outrage. Can you do that? So like, I think I know what you mean. I can do that. And I'm going to put more weight in your final paper. 
and he does, and Cedric passes, and he graduates three years later with a 3-4 average and a double major. So now, you are Larry Wakeford, that professor. What do you do? Believe in this meritocracy that's rewarded you, probably, or say there's a deeper reality. What did Cedric do? What does Owen do? Owen finds his passion. He uses it as a pathway. It reveals his underlying capabilities as nothing else does, just like the rest of us. That's what Cedric does. Gospel, rap, it's his life. He uses his pathway, his passion as pathway, reveals deep capabilities. It's the way he makes sense of the world. Cousins. I think that's what the message of all the books are. Give up your knowingness, your omniscience, your surety. Okay, we should probably end on that because there's food over here. But let me just say thank you all for coming and for letting me rant. And uh, let's eat food. Thanks a lot.